الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد عقيده and creed in islam is one of the most or is the most important thing for us to know and understand unlike some of the groups and sects that we find that emphasize other aspects of the religion which are all important in all aspects of the religion for example some of the ashaira and others and sufis they say that if a person doesn't know fiqh they don't know anything about the religion meaning that fiqh is the most important thing you never hear them discuss aqidah creed or tawhid because in fact no matter how good your your fiqh is no matter what madhhab you follow in your jurisprudence that's not going to enter you into jannah if you do not have correct aqidah correct belief in who allah is and how to worship him properly that we have to know tawhid tawhid is the asas tawhid is the foundation and so i wanted to do a series of durus actually lessons that would be beneficial and this was uh, a suggestion and it's something i've been from from uh, a particular individual may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and bless them with jannatul firdaus and bless us all with guidance and strength and iman and those things which please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i mean and this is something i've been thinking about for a while because in fact when we look on the internet and we look uh in the various forms of media where islam is being produced a lot of times and even not just in the media in fact in islamic communities and this is unfortunate especially in the west and the uk and canada and america and different places like this that you find that there's an absence of actually durus of of lessons of finishing books and going through books especially books of the salaf or at least books of those people who are on the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who are following the salaf as-salih ridwan allah alayhim so we see an absence in real authentic knowledge being presented this doesn't take away from the fact of having lectures or having little bits and pieces of little lessons a little hadith here or a little something as a reminder here that is all beautiful and that is a part of islam and that is a part of learning the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and practicing islam however what really raises a community those things are helpful but it's actually durus it's actually lessons that's what produces students of knowledge that's what produces people who can uh benefit the community is actually having durus and 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 so forth and having actual lessons sitting and finishing treaties finishing doing all of riyad as-salihin not just reading a hadith here without the explanation as some of our brothers and sisters do but in fact it is finishing books finishing text which will benefit us in our iman and benefit us in our akhlaq and benefit us in all the aspects of islam and get us grounded in aqida and so forth so that's sufficient of enough of a a quick introduction i want to read a book that i compiled it's actually an explanation of a very important treatise called Nawaqid al-Islam by Sheikh al-Islam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala and so i compiled this a few years back uh from different explanations of the scholars uh, of some of the scholars in Islam for example i use extensively Sheikh Abdul Aziz Rajihi his explanation Sheikh Abdul Aziz Rais and uh a talabat al-ilm mashallah uh, a sister hanan bint ali bin muhammad al-yamani hafizallah ta'ala uh, in in compiling this also with benefits from al-allama sheikh saleh bin fozan wa sheikh muhammad bin saleh bin uthaymin wa sheikh rabi bin hadi al-madkhali rahimahumullah wa hafizallah sheikh rabi so i compiled this from various uh various treaties and various explanations and I listened to tape Sheikh Ibrahim Rahili and many other scholars of the Sunnah 
and try to put together this treatise. So we're going to try to study this actually, make this an actual study, not just something to listen for entertainment or something that's feel good medicine, so to speak, but we're going to actually try to study this and we'll try to keep it as brief as possible in brief segments until we finish the treatise. So we'll begin with the introduction, bi'idhnillah ta'ala today. In the introduction I started in the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, all praise belongs to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And may peace and blessings be upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam and his companion, From amongst the most important matters that a Muslim should be concerned with after Tawheed is those factors which nullify his Tawheed and nullify his, his Iman. Those things which take you out, disbelief, shirk. And, and polytheism in its various forms. So that's one of the most important things we should be concerned about after Tawheed. We have to know the opposite of Tawheed. So once we begin to study, uh, you know, the categories of Tawheed, for example, Tawheed al-Rububiyya, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya, Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, we need to know what nullifies that, what negates that. And unfortunately, we find in many communities, uh, certain communities, they don't even teach that or emphasize that. And I was just reading a, a piece of literature that is used to give dawah to, to, to non-Muslims about Islam. And it was talking about monotheism, talking about Tawheed. But yet all they talked about was uh, rububiyah. So I almost feel shy in handing that out because it doesn't extensively give you what you need uh, someone needs to know about Islam if they want to know the truth about who Allah is. They need to know that Allah is the only one worthy, worthy of worship. They need to know that He's the creator of the heavens and earth and He's Ar Razak, He's the provider and sustainer. But even the Christians and the Jews know this. They also need to know that all ibadah, all worship is only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Tawheed al ibadah, that's Tawheed al uluhiyah. And they also need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has divine names and attributes which we supplicate to Him and worship Him by those names and attributes. And those divine na names and attributes are unique to Him and we affirm them as Allah affirms them and the Prophet sallallahu affirmed them. And we negate that which Allah negates and the Prophet sallallahu negated in his authentic sunnah. And that's in very a very brief description of Tawheed. So we must know Tawheed and then we must know its opposite. So this treatise we're, we're going to undertake is actually discusses the opposite, those things which nullify Tawheed. So one's actions, statements, or beliefs can take one uh, from the fold of Islam. However, if an individual does not utter or do an action of disbelief, or I'm sorry, if an individual does utter or does an action of disbelief, it does not necessarily expel him or her from Islam. That's an incredibly important qaida, important principle, that when a person, even if they do an act of disbelief or an act of kufr, as we say, disbelief, that that doesn't nece necessitate that they're a disbeliever. And this, why is this an important principle? This is a principle from Ahl Sunnah. This is a principle from the religion of Islam that's established from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Salaf al-Sali radiallahu ta'ala anam ajma'in. That we have to know and understand why, because many people make mistakes in this aspect. Many people, the people who have who are extreme, the, the takfiris, people who uh, rush to declare other Muslims to be apostates, and then other people who are just, maybe they're not well studied in this aspect of creed. So then they they quickly make a ruling upon someone else because they've fallen into an act of disbelief. But instead, this is reserved for the scholars when it comes to making this hukum, making this ruling or this judgment upon another individual. And in the Muslim lands, it's not just reserved to the scholars. In fact, the scholars, no matter how much we, we wish to believe, these matters go to the qada, they go to the to the uh, to the judge, to the Islamic judge in a Muslim land. It doesn't it's not a joke, it's not a light matter matter. So example here in Saudi Arabia, it's not, you don't go to Sheikh so and so, Sheikh Salah bin Fozan even, or Sheikh, you know, these major scholars, Sheikh Lou Hedan and the Kibar ulama. You don't go to them, Sheikh, uh, pronounce, you know, can you make a judgment on so and so? No. You may a ask for a, a general hukum, a general ruling about someone who does this or does this, are they Muslim or not? But when it comes to a particular individual, this is brought to the to the Muslim judge. So this is a court, an educated matter that goes to the Islamic courts. So this shows us the importance and the seriousness of pronouncing uh, takfir and making a ruling. So whenever someone makes a 
uh, an action or a statement of disbelief, it does not necessarily take them out of the fold of Islam. Sheikh uh, Uthman al khumais states, It is an obligation that we understand that if a Muslim enters into the religion, then he cannot be expelled from it except by certainty, except by doing something uh, that it certainly expels him, because that we are sure that they are uh, in the fold of Islam, and there's a qaida or a principle in Islam, al yaqeen la yazil al yaqeen bi shak or kama qil that uh, something that is certain is not removed by doubtfulness, and this applies. This is a general principle. For example, let's apply it to our purification, our tahara. So if you are making um, if you're going to make, you are wondering if you need to make wudu. That means you have, sh you have, but you remember for sure you had wudu an hour ago, for example, or two hours ago. You prayed your last salat and now it's close to the next prayer. And you, it's time, uh, it's, it's, so it's time to prepare yourself for the prayer. And you are certain that you had Tahara, because you prayed your last prayer, you're certain, but you have doubt. Did I break my wudu? I can't remember. Did I go to the restroom? Did I pass gas? The thing that you have yaqeen, you have certainty, is that you were on Tahara. And that it is not your Tahara, your purification is not removed by doubtfulness. Your doubtfulness is that you doubt whether you broke your wudu or not. So then therefore you return to the, the foundation which is that you were on purification because you prayed your last prayer. So then your Yaqeen, your certainty is not removed by doubtfulness. You are certain that you were on Tahara and you doubt whether you, you went to the restroom or not, Akramakum Allah. So that's an important principle in Islam. This applies in Aqidah as well. That someone has entered the Islam uncertainty, they do not remove by doubtful, oh I think so and so is a disbeliever. So and so I heard they did this, or they did this. I, I'm, you know, in my judgment I think they're a disbeliever. No. It, it has to be by certainty that someone is removed from Islam and that's why this is a matter reserved for the people of knowledge. The people are well grounded in these issues and in an Islamic uh, system, this goes to the judge. This this goes, this arbitration, or not arbitration, but this judgment goes to the Islamic judge. So therefore, it is not permissible for us to take lightly judging uh, uh, Sheikh Khomeis, he said, therefore it is not permissible for us to take lightly judging a person with apostasy due to something uncertain. Instead, we must know that those issues that nullify one's Islam and faith so that we are able to make a clear judgment based upon certainty. The issue of takfir, declaring a Muslim to be an apostate, is an incredibly delicate matter which is reserved for the scholars, judges, and those students of knowledge that possess the knowledge, the wisdom, and the taqwa, and the ability to make those judgments regarding specific individuals. That's incredibly important because not everyone, even someone, they could be a well-grounded student of knowledge, but in this issue, they're not very strong. And this applies to scholars as well. Not all those scholars uh, want to make those judgments and are able to make those judgments. Some they are really grounded in maybe in the, in the Arabic language and in tafsir and hadith maybe, but they are not necessarily grounded in making these judgments in, in some of the uh, very intricate issues in Aqidah or intricate Messiah with re relating to making a judgment on a particular individual. So this shows us it's not for everyone. And Min Baba Ola, or firstly as a priority, it's not for us to make those judgments. So the issue of de takfir, declaring a Muslim to be impostate, is incredibly delicate. And takfir is a Sharia ruling. This is a statement of uh, the statement is uh, a statement of one of the scholars here that takfir is a sharia ruling and it returns to Allah and his messenger. It returns to Allah and his uh, messenger, وسلم, like the declar declaration of what is lawful and prohibited and what is considered an obligation that returns to Allah and His Messenger. Likewise, takfir and everything that is described as disbelief, whether it is from a statement or an action is considered the major disbelief, which expels an individual from Islam by Allah 
and his messenger. The, this, these judgments are reserved for Allah and his messenger. Therefore, it is not permissible for us to declare disbelief except by what is plain and clear evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah. Therefore, it is not sufficient to base this verdict upon doubtfulness or uncertainty due to the fact that it entails very si serious and dangerous rulings. So if the Sharia punishments do not consider doubtfulness in making judgments on a person and the implications are less serious than takfir, then caution in making takfir should be exercised, cutting off any possible doubt. This is why the Prophet said, warned against pronouncing takfir upon an individual that is not a disbeliever when he said, any person who says to his brother, O Kafir, then it returns to one of them, either it is as he pronounced or it returns back to him. This was a uh, actually a statement of the uh, major, the Hayatul Kibar Ulama in Saudi Arabia. This is from their um, one of their uh, the books that are compiled, which has many of their fatawa and research. So this was uh, a statement from there. Uh, we'll continue on very briefly, be in the La Taala. And takfir is divided into two categories, the general and the specific takfir. So takfir is divided into two categories in general. We say takfir uh, mutlaq or takfir al-mu'ayyin. Takfir mutlaq is the general takfir, meaning that you declare someone to be an apostate or you declare, for example, it's a wasf or a description of a group of people or someone who does a particular action. For example, um, a, uh, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes takfir of the people of the book, especially after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa those people who practice polytheism. They are, this is a general pronouncement. So we don't have to go to a specific individual, but everyone, this includes everyone, this is the general description. Those people who commit shirk with Allah, uh, the major shirk, are disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in Surah Al-Bayinah, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Allah Taala says, Verily those who disbelieve from amongst the people of the book, people of the scripture, and the pagans will abide in the fire forever. So that is a general ruling that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has made. So whoever falls into that category, that is the general ruling. Takfir al-ma'ayin is when we apply that ruling to a specific individual. We say so-and-so has committed shirk and they are a disbeliever for these reasons. And there are also conditions related to that and there are impediments to takfir. And we're gonna talk more, much more in depth and that's a dars in and of itself. Before we even get into the treaties, we will discuss about it. So we have a basic understand about, understanding about the issue of takfir. And this is a very seri serious and sincere, uh, since, uh, serious uh, topic. And the only reason that I speak about it because it's applicable to this and will take from the scholars and also in fact myself I have uh, done my master's thesis and my thesis was in Thai, was about takfir and about its effect upon the modern day movements and groups and so this is actually something I spent at least four years of my life studying and I sat with many different scholars asked them questions had many private sittings and did research, went through the books of the scholars, the classical and the uh, more contemporary scholars of Ahl Sunnah to, uh, to compile and form my research. So we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil and until our next lesson, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.